Bismillah, walhamdulillah, and Allah's blessings and mercy be upon all of His prophets. You do not make any difference amongst any of them. My dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And finally, we are with the Dajjal. I've already spoken about Al Mahdi, his coming, Ibn Sayyid, and spoken about so many different things. Today, I'm going to speak to you about Ad Dajjal and also because inherently, if Ad Dajjal is here, we will also speak about the coming of Jesus. Ad Dajjal is a topic that every believer out there has heard about him in a way or another, or just because people talk a lot about this Dajjal. The matter of Ad Dajjal itself and Al Mahdi and everyone else has become part of Al Islam. And in the court of the believers, it has become that if you do not believe in Ad Dajjal, you are not a Muslim, you are not a believer. When in fact, this is not true. And because people don't read these days, they just consume Islam through listening. They tend to fall at the mercy of whoever is talking to them. And if that person has an agenda, then they also fall under that agenda. If the speaker is an Azhari Sheikh from Egypt, he will talk to you about Ad-Dajjal or any other subject with whatever the institution, the organized religion body of Al-Azhar agrees and likes. If he is a Salafi, then he will talk to you with what the whole Wahhabi organized religion uh, that is in Saudi Arabia today, in the Arabian Gulf, and whatever that body agrees and accepts as Islam, then this speaker will talk to you with that in mind. If this speaker is a Shia, he will also talk to you with whatever the whole Shia think is all about, about the Mahdi and all the events that will take place. Of course, if someone says to them, they don't believe in a Dajjal, myself, I don't believe in a Dajjal, and uh, even though when it comes to the Qur'an you have done nothing, absolutely nothing wrong, but to them they will take uh, this argument and escalate it differently. They cannot tell you it is haram not to believe in a Dajjal because they can't prove that. They take another route, and that is, Ad-Dajjal has been spoken about by the Messenger of Allah. If you reject Ad-Dajjal, that also means you reject the Hadith, the Sunnah. And if you reject the Hadith and Sunnah, then you are a Kafir. And you can apply these escalating arguments pretty much in anything. If you tell them, for example, I don't believe that the Messenger would curse a woman who puts makeup and goes out. They will tell you, no, the hadith says so, and if you don't believe in that, it also means you don't believe in sunnah, you're careful, and pretty much you can apply this law in anything else. Recently, I was just listening to a talk, and as I said before, every month I consume about 60, 80 hours listening, researching, reading, and doing all kinds of stuff, especially when I have a topic in mind. I do not leave a stone untouched, so to speak. So I was listening to a talk about uh, this, an ex-Wahhabi sheikh that was blowing the cover on Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Wahhabism and all that kind of stuff, and then this particular sheikh said something that really upset me, and I did write to him and asked uh, for a discussion between him and myself, and that I'm happy to call him or write to him and things like that. Of course, no answer to my thing, because I wrote some arguments in the body of my email message to him and I said you say this because he spoke in a video clip so I told him in the minute XYZ you say this and what you're saying is wrong because and then I go and give my arguments as to why I believe this person is wrong and uh, I did that for two three occasions but this sheikh they were, didn't get back to me for whatever reason but hey that is the, his reasons are with him for judgment today but this particular sheikh said something that really, really angry with me. He said this, that at the Jad will be the biggest test that Allah will ever send to humans while on earth. 
those who will live long enough to meet up with the Dajjal will experience the events with him directly. So it's head, hands on. So you, you live with the Dajjal, you experience what happens. But he said, now this is what really upset me and angered me. But he said, but as for those who won't live to see at the jail, i.e. those who are going to die before meeting at the jail, then they will be put to an equal test in their graves as if they had met with at the jail. Pretty much, it's, he's saying that when you die, Allah is going to send you a test that equals that of Ad-Dajjal, and you will be trialed in your Qabr. And that really angered me, because that is absolutely wrong, 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 wrong. And uh, what can we say? Now, I am going in this talk here, talk to you about Ad-Dajjal. It might take two or three sessions about talking about this, because I'm not going to just narrate to you the events that are going to happen like in this futuristic post-apocalyptic uh, era. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I will tell you the hadith in the sequence of what they say. The gel comes out and does this, does that. So I will uh, kind of like narrate to you the story as is known today, but I will comment on each part as to why that whatever event they're talking about cannot be true, it cannot hold its water, and as such, that's why a Dajjal cannot exist. As if the confusions already caused by Al-Mahdi and Ibn Sayyid, and I encourage you, if you have not listened to my talks about Ibn Sayyid, go back to them and take this talk from Ibn Sayyid and come up here so that you form a good idea about what I am talking about. So, as if those confusions in Ibn Sayyid and Al-Mahdi weren't enough, we're going to add up a third element, and that is at the Dajjal. But before proceeding, I'd like to share this thought with you. The time of the appearance of Al-Mahdi and that of Isa and Ad-Dajjal and uh, Ibn Sayyid at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all these events as how they happened is not compatible with each other. I would have loved seeing a movie, Sceneries from Hollywood, take the best top movie maker and give him the events, how Al-Mahdi will appear, how Ad-Dajjal will appear, how Isa will come, and how this and how that, and this scenario, the best, will scratch their head, because the timeline of the events is not compatible, and you will see this as I proceed through this talk. By now, you know very well that our men of religion are dishonest, and they really are dishonest. Any sheikh is dishonest, really any, any of them, because they all have taken the knowledge from a particular school or university or ideology, and they preach accordingly, and they will tell you anything that the other institution says, because at the end of the day, if he doesn't, then guess what? He'll be criticized and categorized as kafir and, and innovator and so on and so forth. So they always stay within the guidelines of the university they took the knowledge from, even though they know in the books, different books written by different scholars, there are different sayings. But those sayings that are different to what his school of thought tells him, he will never ever say them to you, because for him, he will preach to you what he believes him, what his institution taught him, and you will follow the Islam according to how he sees it, not as Allah sees it. You see, Allah looks at Islam, sees at Islam through the Quran, not the Hadith, not the Sunnah, not what the scholars say, on judgment day, you will meet Allah and you will have, be held responsible based on how you interacted with Al-Qur'an. On Judgment Day, the Qur'an will be the only book in the court of Allah. You will not find Bukhari, Muslim, Ibn Kathir, Tirmidhi. You will find none of these things. But these sheikhs today, as I said, are dishonest. They will tell people good stories, and but will hide facts, and they know these facts do not work with each other. And they are just blind contradictions with the rest of the story. So the only uh, side they will take is the side that will work for them and their school of uh, thoughts. The story of Ad-Dajjal himself is a very valueless 
topic at all. It should not have been given any space at all in the beautiful religion of Allah. But we stuck with it. People are talking about Al-Mahdi. Is Al-Mahdi coming? Is a Dajjal? What will happen? This so much so that it has become like the Lord of the Rings. It's, it's a big fictional story altogether. They say to you and to me and to everyone else that at the jet is the first sign of the major signs of the hour. It's the first of the major signs. And it, that is what's generally believed in, the, in our Sunni sect at all. So at the jet is the first major sign of the hour. And what this means is that there are many major signs that will indicate the end of the world. And they are just around the corner. And the first of those major signs is the appearance of of a Dajjal. The belief has been reached by following what Ibn Hajar deducted and believed in. So we go back again to Mr. Ibn Hajar. And just in case you don't know who Ibn Hajar is, Al-Asqalani, he is a Sunni scholar. However, his aqid, as the Salafi would like to call it, he is an Ash'ari. An Ash'ari is a hated sect in the Salafi world. Just like a Nawawi and many others, but because a Nawawi and Ibn Hajar Asqalani have been approved by the scholar's body back six, seven centuries ago, well, guess what? The people of today cannot reject them. So, and I heard this with my own eyes, a big sh uh, Salafi sheikh, uh, it's a Wahhabi discussed as Salafi, was asked about Ibn Hajar Asqalani. They told him Ibn Hajar Asqalani has got the wrong belief. He is an Ash'ari. How can we in, in the Salafi world give him such a high praise and the Sheikh now is trapped? So he told him, well, for those who have died, we accept them because now they are with Allah. But those alive, we should fight them. We should keep teaching them. Should, so what an hypocritical thought. It's, uh, but anyhow, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani is a man that has existed 570 years ago. So he is is almost 600 years, six centuries ago. It is this man, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who compiled what is known today as Sahih al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari's book was not written as you see it today. It's this man, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who has compiled Al-Bukhari, and he compiled it from three, 13 different versions of the, the Bukhari book. And those 13 different versions, they had different hadiths, different numbers, different wordings, different chain of narrators. They were a mess. And uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani wrote this in the introduction to his uh, commentary on uh, uh, Al-Bukhari. It's called Hadi uh, Sari Fi Sharh Sahih Al-Bukhari. Uh, it's uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. So, but anyhow, so this Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, as I said, is a highly respected in the Salafi world, even though his aqid, as they like to call it, his belief, is not from their sect. He is an Ash'ari. Anyhow, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani said, the appearance of Ad-Dajjal in human form is not the major sign. You see how the battle girls, they say it's major, is not. So it's according to who says what and what you, which one you want to pick. But you know, he says, but is rather how he changes from the human being to what he will become. That is the major sign. And despite him being a human being, he will order the sky to rain, and the sky shall obey, and he will order the earth to bring out its crops and produce, and it shall obey, and that he will be supported by so many different elements which are out of the ordinary. It is general belief, my dear sisters and my brothers, in amongst our men of religion that the major signs will come out in the following order. At the jail comes first, the descent or the coming of Isa, then the coming out of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the earthquakes, the smoke rising of the sun from the west, the appearance of the beast, the fire that will gather people for resurrection. And you can go back to Fath al-Bari in the introduction of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. He lays down all these kind of things. Our men of religion believe that those major signs will happen one after the other. They will act as the countdown 
bomb, if you will, till explosion, till the end of the world. They even go to the extreme of mentioning some man-made hadith. Always remember, all these hadith are man-made. But you know, so they will tell you about these hadith that are reported by the famous Abu Huraira, where he claims that the Messenger of Allah said, the appearance of the signs shall happen on the footsteps of each other. They will be like the beads of a necklace. Once the necklace breaks, all the beads will fall one after the other. And this hadith is in At-Tabari and also reported by Ahmed. And they say it has a chain, or an authentic chain of narrator. So let's get started with the first of those major signs, and that is Ad-Dajjal itself. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about his name. Why is it Ad-Dajjal? But you know, Ad-Dajjal is one part of two names because his full name, as he is known, is Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal. Okay, I repeat, his full name is Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal, shortened to Ad-Dajjal. At first, the name in English would just mean Al-Masih, just what you call it, right? Uh, or the Messiah. But Ad-Dajjal comes the verb of Ad-Dajjal, Dajjala. And Ad-Dajjal is the act of covering lies and deceit with good acts, with the intent of hurting others. The closest interpretation of his name is a con man. So instead of saying Ad-Dajjal, you can say the con man, and you are not very far at all. However, when our scholars wanted to debate the meaning of his name, they couldn't find a final meaning to it, because again, if this was from Allah, you wouldn't find scholars ping pong in it. What you say, no, I don't agree with him, I say this. And you would not believe it. They disagreed about the meaning of his name. And Al-Qurtubi, the great scholar of Al-Qurtubi, he said that there were 23 opinions about the meaning of his name. Some other sheikhs reached 50 opinions, different opinions about what Ad-Dajjal, the Khan man, means. The bottom line is, they say that the term Masih carries the two opposite meanings together. In other words, Al-Masih is a coin on one side, it means the truthful, and on the other side, it means liar. And they cite, because Allah calls Isa alayhi salam in Al-Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ الْمَسِيحُ So Allah has named Al-Isa as a Masih. But the Hadith named the Khan man also as Al-Masih. So what is Al-Masih? Why did Allah call Isa, إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Indeed, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, is nothing else but a messenger of Allah. Why would Allah say this to the children of Israel? What would the children of Israel understand by the term Messiah when Allah speaks it to them? Are they going to think like, oh, it's two uh, meanings and uh, on one side it's good and on the other side it's not good? Well, it's not that at all. It really, it's not that at all. Here is what happens usually. The thing is, Back then, and it, it still exists today in Christianity, in Judaism, and we Muslims, we also do it to a certain extent. When someone embraces Christianity or Judaism or Islam, what do they do? They baptize them. They baptize them. And I will leave a link for you in the description of this video, of this talk below, where they show you a real practical example on how people that accept Jesus as their Savior, their Lord, and how they get baptized in water. Already? So, the Jews do it, the Christians do it, and we Muslims also do it. But we don't do it like the Jews and Christians in a church or things like that. You just make ghusl, you go wash yourself with water. Why do you wash yourself with water? That's how you baptize yourself for the new faith. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, back in time, the children of Israel, from the time Musa alayhi salam, all the way to Isa, to Jesus, whenever someone became religious, they would baptize them, and they would, A, oint their body with oil. So the person has their body all wiped up in water, uh, sorry, in oil. 
And then they come up with another idea, and that is what you see today baptized, baptized in person and put them in a sink or pour water on them or a river or anything. But as much as they should get into some kind of liquid to cleanse themselves. And this is why Allah tells the children of Israel that Jesus, son of Mary, when he was born, he also went through the process of baptism. You have baptized the kid. He is one of you and he couldn't be Allah's kid. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically telling them. And this is why Allah calls Isa salam al-Masih. But at the jail they gave him the other one, al-Masih at the jail and they got stuck with the name al-Masih. What are we going to do with it? And then they say, oh, the reason he's called al-Masih is because one of his eyes, mamsuh, the Arabic masaha in Arabic is to wipe something uh, over something, okay, to remove something gently. So they said, well, because his eyes are messed up, so th that's why he's called al-Masih. The other one said, no, 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 that's not because of that. It's because of the smooth talking, how he will wipe over people, how he will resurrect this. And that, as I said, 23 or 50, you take your pick. Now the question is that we should always ask ourselves is why? Why would Allah send a, a Dajjal to humanity? What's the purpose behind it? Is it for... You see, when you start thinking about Al-Masih Al-Dajjal is Allah says in Al-Quran إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ Surely your Lord, i.e. Allah, knows best who has strayed from his path. And it is Allah alone who knows who is on the right path. So Allah knows who is the believer of us and who is not, not the believer for us. So why would Allah send ad dajjal as a test for humanity? What's the purpose behind that? Is that people suddenly come clean in front of Allah and make Allah that like he needed to ad dajjal to reveal to him he was the believer and who is not? Really the question begs to be asked. You see, when you look at it, if Allah knows which path humanity shall take, why the ad uh, gel test and to make it more interesting for the listeners these people this man of religion claim that Allah will give a Dajjal attributes and powers that only a God can have as we will see throughout this talk here and then they expect people not to follow him not to believe in him if you go to the most observing believer a believer that is going through hardships if you came to me I lost my son my kid 26 of years of age and he is dead right in front of me lying right in front of me I just watched his body and the Arabs see everything I can see all that and then comes at the jail and he will tell me look I am Allah and I will resurrect your child for you and he will get back as he was before he dies and even better and then this man wipes over my child and life gets and my kid gets back to life and I'm looking at, and the kid wakes up and goes, oh, dad, how are you? Kisses me, hugs me, and then he gets dressed and we take him home. How am I not going to believe that this person here is truly a God in a human form? Because I know only a God can resurrect. And since Allah has given Ad-Dajjal the ability to perform what only Allah can do, and I've seen it with my own eyes, why would Allah blame me then in believing this? Ya Allah, you gave him the power. Why did you give him the power? Why did you give him the power to mislead me? And it's not like a whisper of shaitan. This is a practical power. A shaitan only whispers to us at the jail. He does things in front of us. He goes to a land where people are dying out of thirst. The animals, nothing going on. And at the jail comes on, looks at the sky, rain, and the rain falls down. People drink, animals eat, everything, the crops, everything, the fields. And the fields, they don't take a whole season. It's morning, the afternoon, as we will see. And then, Ya Allah, you blame me for believing in this guy? What kind of a God are you for doing this to me? You see what I mean? So that's why my dear sisters and my brothers, the term Al-Masih or the Messiah literally means the anointed one. And as I said, the anointed one is someone who is smeared or rubbed with oil as part of a religious ceremony to baptize somebody into that religion. And as I said, this act 
was back in time thousands of years and is still performed in Judaism and Christianity and to some degree in our Islam and I am sure if you've seen some movies uh, and when they baptize somebody you will know exactly what I am talking about but at the Jeff's name is not because of his physical looks is because of what exactly they don't know 23 talks, 50 talks. The argument goes on. But that's why they just call him Ad Dajjal. So, enough with his name and let's with this con man. We're going to call him the con man, Ad Dajjal, the con man. And uh, let's move on. We're going to go to another point that is a great deal of contradictions. And that is in his description. Ad Dajjal is a human being like you and me. He has a dad and he has a mother. Or so they say. And to make people believe, they tell them that the hadith speak about Ad-Dajjal have reached the level of mutawatir. And I have already uh, answered this and explained what a mutawatir is, and it's impossible to have it. That's why in the number of mutawatir, that is group that tells you, group to you, only two hadiths. And please go back to my talk, it's on YouTube where I explain about the mutawatir, why it's impossible to have. But you know, they say, that Ad-Dajjal is, is, is a human being with a dad and a mother. And, and needless to say, by the way, that the whole issue about this Dajjal is more fictional than anything else. And I will tell you why throughout this series. They tell, or the men of religion tell people that the hadiths are authentic and are here to introduce Ad-Dajjal or the con man to people and also warn them of his mischief so that when he appears they will recognize him and will not follow him and only those upon whom the disgrace of Allah has been written will believe and follow him of course my dear sisters and my brothers this is a pure lie because this statement is saying that the con man at the jail is more of a punishment rather than a test meaning that Allah had first to make a choice who is disgraced and who is not to be disgraced, then he would send a Dajjal and then it is Allah who will make the disgraced follow him. So all this is Allah forcing people behind the scenes. And then of course, what is the divine justice and free will of mankind? And I'd like you to note here, my dear sisters and my brothers, and as you already know, I don't believe in any of this fictional nonsense and you can already start to see the contradictions and differences of opinions about this fictional entity and the same can also be said about all those humanly invented major signs that are uh, to come and I will explain to, to you as we go along if scholars themselves and for the last 14 centuries could not agree on the meaning of his name or his description or his doings how are people at the end of time ever going to remember this madness? If it was mentioned in the Quran, good. But this is not in the Quran. It's a battlefield out there. And uh, if Allah is going to end the world in 50 centuries from now, and with, today we've got 23 arguments and 50 arguments just about his name. Yeah, I will tell you the, all the contradictions and fights between scholars about his descriptions, everything about this uh, man, uh, the con man. How are people the, uh, 50 centuries later going to ever remember all this madness? So, let's move on to his description now, and we're going to start fighting what he looks like, really. They claim, when I say they claim, I'm talking about the men of religion, the people that talk to you, anyone that claims that the jail will come, they will tell you that at the jail will be a young man, white, and he'll be short. He will have curved legs. He will have bushy and fuzzy hair, pronounced forehead, a wide neck, his right eye erased, and by erased, they mean the eye won't be pronounced. It won't be out there like you would see a normal eye. And then they say, as a whole, it'll be just like a normal, regular eye, just it will have a skin covering it up. And that the skin will be like a dried grape, while his Right, uh, left eye will have a thick skin over it and between his two eyes is written kafara the letters k f r kafara the disbeliever 
This description seems like a pretty conclusive one. However, there are millions of people who would fit this description exactly, with only one difference, the writing between the eyes. No one other than a Dajjal can have it, but millions of people will be white, short, curved, bushy, fuzzy hair, pronounced forehead, and the eyes and things like that. Now let me bring the contradictions to you. Is it one word or three separate letters? Some hadiths, they say, it'll be just three letters. K, F, R. That's what you're gonna see between his eyes. While some other hadiths, they will state that will be a whole word. Kafara. And when you write Kafara, you will need the vowels. So it's gonna be Kafara. So in English, when there are only three letters, it's K F R. But now, if we are going to say it's Kafir, we need to say K A F A R. He is a disbeliever. So now, is it three letters? Is it one word attached? And they also say that any person out there, it doesn't matter what their mother tongue is, will be able to read the Arabic. Or that's why they are, if they can read it, then they will understand his kafir. So what's the purpose of all this? Ya Allah, you send us this godlike human, and we gotta look between his eyes, and then we read K F R. So we've read his kafir. But what he does, only a god can do. How am I gonna work with these two things? Yeah, Allah him However. This writing won't be of great help, as I said, to people, because the huge majority of people, as they say, will follow at the jail. Anyway, so it's no big deal. And they say, except a small portion from Mecca and Al Madina. Of course, when they came to Al Madina, they say that Al Madina will shake, i.e., earthquake, three times. The first time it will take away all the hypocrites and everybody will be thrown away to face at the jail. Imagine, you're a hypocrite in Al Madina leading a life, you're not a g and then suddenly Al Madina earthquakes and you find yourself catapulted in the air and then until you fall right in front of the jail oops what am i doing here hello you sure i mean nothing no repentance nothing 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 and then on the second one it'll be people with the weak faith and women and suddenly again you're not a good muslim you miss salat you lie you do uh, suddenly the earthquake shakes and that's you on the uh, in the air to meet at the jail the third one is other people also with different levels of iman and this la ilaha illallah now the thing is my this is my brother and this is what really brings the whole issue of a Dajjal or any issue like this down they tell you Allah sends a Dajjal as a test now let's reason a little bit what is Allah's vision here what does he want he wants to see who is the believer who is not and also he will make people realize that this person is not a God and when Isa kills a Dajjal then people should turn and should believe in Allah more. But guess what? That does not happen. At the jail comes and goes and humanity doesn't change. And what this shows, it shows that Allah hasn't been successful in what he wanted to do. He wanted something, he did his best, he sent the jail and he failed. And of course this is a huge lie. There are many narratives describing Ad Dajjal. Each narrative builds on a clearer picture about this man than the other. So the question, and but they differ again and they contradict each other on which eye is dead. Is it the right eye or is it the left eye? Ibn Umar said, and this hadith is in Al Bukhari. And as you know, in the worshippers of the hadith, it's authentic and you cannot argue with this hadith. But there, again, let's use the argument just to argue with them. Ibn Umar said that Allah's Messenger said, While I was sleeping, I saw myself in a dream performing, performing tawaf around the Kaaba. That's when I saw a reddish white man with long and straight hair and water was dropping from his head. I asked, who oh, is this? They replied, the son of Mary, and they referred to Jesus. Then I turned my face to see another man with a huge body, red complexion, and curly hair. 
Okay, it's not fuzzy, it's not bushy, but this one is curly hair and blind in one eye. His eye looked like a protruding out grape. They said to me, so he didn't ask here, but they said to him, he is at the jail. The prophet then added, the man, okay, at the jail, now he's going to give them a resemblance to who at the jail resembles uh, to. They said that the prophet said, the man he resembled most to is Ibn Qutn, or Ibn Qutn. And this man is a f man from the tribe of Khuza'a. And this hadith is in Al-Bukhari. Now, what kind of a prophet, what kind of prophet is this? Who will put the life of one of his companions at the mercy of people? At the jail looks like Ibn Qutn. What has this man done to deserve this accusation from a prophet? What has this man done to be linked to a Dajjal? And then, from whom? From a man that Allah has sent as a mercy to mankind. It's like you saying to your dad, I saw today a child sex pervert and molester on the news, and he looks exactly like you. You, you look almost like you look like you are that man. How is your father going to take that? How is your mother, your siblings, your community going to take your statement? If you're walking down the street on a public transport and someone comes to you and says, you know what, last night I saw an assassin, a man who murdered, uh, blah, 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 and he looks like you. So if you would not accept that, why would you accept something from a messenger? And this messenger has been praised by Allah. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ A messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves, a human being from people that you know. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ Your suffering distresses him. حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ He is very anxious and very protective about your you and your well-being. بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ and he is full of kindness and mercy towards the believers and then he turns to his companions and says at the jail looks like that man would a man with this godly endorsement and recommendation act like what al-Bukhari claimed the hadithic messenger is someone who doesn't care about people's feelings he actually doesn't even care about their safety and their well-being. What if some maniac went and killed this man Ibn Qutn or Ibn Qutn just because he resembled an evil futuristic creature? Blessed be our messenger and blessed the day he walked on earth because the man that is the messenger of Allah that is in the Quran is completely different than the man that is in a hadith and the books of the seer and so on and so on. But you know, I can sit here my dear sister and my brother and mention a number of man-made hadith about ad dajjal but I will mention one hadith because it really will shed more light on this issue and pretty much comprehensive on the whole idea. But before going to that, I will let's discuss the left eye. Again, this hadith is in Muslim. Hudayfa reported that the messenger of Allah said ad dajjal is blind in the left eye with thick hair. And this is in Muslim. So Bukhari, Muslim. Again, now we're gonna go. So now we have a description of a man. The right, it's the blind. No, it's the left that is the blind. Maybe it's both, maybe it's not. But then we have another hadith that is now in Bukhari and Muslim at the same time. Where Abdullah ibn Umar said, One day the messenger of Allah mentioned Al Masih al Dajjal, the Antichrist in the presence of the people and said verily Allah is not one eyed but Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal is blind in the right eye which looks like a swollen grape and this hadith is also reported in Bukhari and Muslim the problem with this is when Muslim reported it's the left eye why would he report that is also on the right eye is it like pick and choose to sum up my dear sisters this hadith hadith in Bukhari his eye looked like a protruding out grape no specification of which eye hadith number two in Muslim, Ad-Dajjal is blind in the left eye hadith number three which is in Bukhari and Muslim a 
it says that the judge is blind in the right eye. In a court of law, the messenger's statement will be rejected. Someone says it's the right eye, and someone says it's the left eye. Of course, as usual, you have the hadith mechanics who will try to fix this issue. They said that even though the hadith mentioned that the Adjjal is blind in both eyes, they also withheld that both hadiths are authentic. And this poses a real problem. Ibn Hajar, again Ibn Hajar al-Asqadani, the great one, and what do you know about Ibn Hajar by now? He holds the opinion that the hadith in Bukhari, which holds that Adjjal is blind in the right eye, is stronger than the hadith of Muslim, which says it's the left eye. Of course, this is his opinion. Many other scholars, they say, no, you're wrong, let's do something else with it, and they went. Al-Qadi Iyad, again, another man that existed 870 years ago, said, both eyes of Ad-Dajjad will have problems. <laughs> this is like, he's a good mechanic. Now this man, so because both narrations are authentic, so right, left, you have to accept them, so we're going to say, both of them have problems. One eye is blind and the other is covered with a thick skin. Of course, with this kind of fixing, the rest of scholars jumped on this explanation and they stopped talking about this issue, even though the hadiths remain problematic. Because if they were a revelation from Allah, then we have a serious problem because Allah doesn't know what he's telling us. It's the right and the left and then we get confused and we try to solve them uh, by ourselves. So it's either Allah doesn't know how to pass authentic information to us or that his messenger isn't good enough to relate to us the information given to him by Allah or those who have heard it from him weren't good enough to transmit the information to us. In all three situations, the information itself must get rejected. And in all cases, we have a huge problem. So we still, we don't know it's the right or the left. At the jail, they tell us, has no progeny. They say that the judge is trial and won't be able to have kids. Yet, when they said that Ibn Sayyid was at the judge, if you remember, Omar Ibn Khattab swearing and a group of companions agreeing that Ibn Sayyid is at the jail, he had a son, a pious son, a scholar of the followers of the companions. Please go back to my talk on Ibn Sayyid to get a better idea about this point and other points. So is at the jail Ibn Sayyid? No. Does he have kids? No. It's a mess. It's really, it really is a mess. Now there is another question that comes to mind. Is at the jail alive? Was he alive at the time of the messenger? If yes, where was he living? Why didn't the messenger go kill him? Because he said to them, if he comes out and I am amongst you, I will take care of him, I will kill him. But now we have a hadith that is in Muslim, and I will read it to you. And the hadith says that a man told the messenger that is at the jail is alive. Yet the messenger didn't go out, didn't kill him, didn't take care of him. Now, let me tell you this. Allah Radim, sometimes it gives me a headache just to talk about these kind of things. But hey, there are a necessity to understand why a big luggage has been added to Allah's religion, which is in Al-Quran, so much so that people today are totally confused after 1400 years, and we still don't know where we're going with all the kind of things. But anyhow, a group of questions which really shouldn't be asked, they shouldn't exist anyway. But they exist because of a strange hadith. Again, a hadith that is considered sahih, that has been explained and defended. And if you say a word, a single word against this hadith, you are a kafir. Remember, it's not because you reject the hadith, it's because you reject the sunnah. It's all or nothing. It's, it's, it's worse than the musketeers. But, you know, oh, I, I have small kittens. I have three of them. So if you hear like some meowing, it's just they are there. It's beautiful three. But, you know. The hadith, Amir ibn Sharahil, a shabi this is the name of a person, maybe it means nothing to you, but would mean something to a Salafi who would hear this. And he says, this Amir ibn Sharahil, a shabi reported that he asked Fatima, daughter ibn Qais, the sister of Al-Dahag, ibn Qais. She was amongst the first immigrants to al Madina. So because she was the first immigrant, you gotta take her words seriously. Amir told her, tell me a 
hadith which you had directly heard from Allah's messenger without mentioning any extra link in between you and him i.e. the woman must have heard it directly from the messenger to this man Amir okay so uh, she said okay she said very well if you like I am prepared to do that he said to her well do it and narrate that to me what I'm reading here is a translation but in Arabic it goes like it's a, it's a scenario for a movie in Hollywood I'm gonna tell you please to tell me they just needed to add how she was dressed what she was sitting and the lights and whatever and to make the good movie but anyhow he said to her well do it and narrate that to me she said one day I heard someone making an announcement to go to the messenger's mosque for salah so I set out towards the mosque and observed prayer along with Allah's messenger so it's a woman who heard someone calling for salat she went there and at the time of Rasulullah my dear sisters and my brother, there was no adhan adhan as you know today the call for salat is an invented act at the time of Rasulullah it was some people calling just oh it's time for salat and people kept track there was no adhan and this hadith and many others show that but it's just again Muslims today consume Islam Islam by listening they don't read they don't research but anyhow so again she heard somebody so she went to perform a salat and she said I was in the first row of the women which was near the last row of men why would she say this to a man who already knows where women are but you know why because the scholars who wrote this hadith in the third centuries wanted to specifically add extra information which serves their school of thought about how women should be with men all right but anyway let's go on we need the hadith here when Allah's messenger had finished his prayer he sat on the member smiling now I wanted to picture this Rasulullah assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum people remained sitting then he went and sat on the member and he's facing people smiling with a grin on his face and then he said everywhere shipper remain sitting in your place and then he added do you know why I asked you to assemble now if it was time for Salat well people know exactly that but if not then they assembled they said Allah and his messenger know best this expression was true when the messenger was alive now that he is dead it's only Allah knows best he said by Allah I have not made you assemble to give you good news or to warn you and this is a lie I swear to you it's a lie because Allah has said in the Quran that he only and we only send messenger either as warner or giver of good news and that's what a messenger does if he talks to his people it's either to warn them or to give them good news but here they say that the Rasulullah said I did not assemble you to give you the good news or to warn you so what did you get us Ya Rasulullah why did you give us this what he gets it's rather to tell you what Tamim Ad-Dari Tamim Ad-Dari this man was a Christian before he embraced Islam so and he's telling the, he's telling the messenger a story and even that took place before when he was Christian and he's telling it now to the messenger of Allah and when the messenger heard it he wanted to relay he wanted to endorse it uh, and give it to the people so he said to them that okay he told me something which agrees with what I once told you about at Dajjal okay so Tamim al-Dari is going to support now what the messenger has said about Ad-Dajjal and by the messenger telling people what At-Tamim Ad-Dari said about Ad-Dajjal the messenger then endorses and says it's true what At-Tamim Ad-Dari is telling so it's, it's two way really he told me that he once boarded a ship along with 30 other men from Lacham. Lacham is a, a place, okay? And Judam, two places, two places just like you say London and Oxford or New York and two places to get smaller villages. As they were sailing, the sea became unsettled and the ship was tossed about by waves for a whole month. I wanted to picture
much of this, this dramatic thing. 30 men, the sea gets angry and keeps throwing them for a whole month. 30 days, the sea is angry. I don't know where these people were in, I don't know, I really, but anyhow, when the waves came down and calmed down, they found themselves near an island. The sun was about to set. So they boarded small side boats and entered the island. It's like the Titanic. You have the big ship. You've got small canoes and things like that in case of emergencies. So here we have 30 people, 30 days at sea, and then they make it uh, to, the, to, to land. There we found some sort of a beast with long, thick hair. And because of its thick hair, they could not distinguish its face from its back. They said, who do you? Who can you be? Now, I want you to imagine this. You come to an island and you have a monster facing you. When you look at the monster, you do not know if you're looking at the back or the front. Everything is covered in hair. And then you talk to it. Who are you? Hey, you. Well, who are you? You, say, you? you get scared. You jump on your canals and you head back to your ship, right? But these people are all Superman, it, it just the Avengers, it, it just reminds me, you've got Superman, you've got Iron Man, you've got uh, Spider-Man and Ant-Man, you've got all this kind of stuff there, so they're not scared of her, so they ask, who, to you, who can you be? Thereupon it says, I am al Jassasa. al Jassasa scholars again differ about the name, but they took it from al Jassus. al Jassus is the spy. So I just says as they say is the spying beast, the spying whatever is it. So they say, What is Al Jassasa? It answered people. So she completely ignored their question and she said, People, there is somebody at the monastery who is much eager to know more about you. The narrator, Amr said, when it named a person for us to meet, we were afraid for it lest it should be a devil. Because when she said this name, at the jail is waiting to meet up and uh, spoke to you. So these travelers, these sailors, got scared. It could be a devil waiting for us. So we quickly went on till we got to the monastery and found a well-built person. So he's not short anymore. He is well-built person. His hands were tied to his neck. And he had iron shackles between his two legs up to his uncle, ankles. So here... Picture this, okay? I wanted to picture this. It's really dramatic for a good movie. These 30 days, 30 things, the sea throws them. They don't know where they are. They end up on an island. They talk to some kind of beast. And they, hey, who are you? Think like she completely ignores them and tells them there is somebody who wants to meet you. Now, how can she know who they are for that person to meet them? Does she know the unseen? Is it written on their heads for her that they come from uh, the peninsula, the Arabian peninsula? But anyhow, the story goes on like this. So now that they are facing with this beast, they said to him, Woe to you, who are you? He answered, You will soon come to know who I am. But first, tell me who you are. So now this beast actually acknowledges that he doesn't know who they are. So we said, We are a people from Arabia. And we sailed the sea and were thrown about for a month. And we got thrown near this island. Then we get into the side boats and landed on this island. And there we met a beast. Okay. Uh, this is absolutely strange because they go and tell him that this beast had a hair. We couldn't tell the back from the forth. And this tells you how the narrator was more entertaining people as opposed to reporting a hadith. Because he will tell him, oh, this, uh, this beast uh, who met us with profusely thick hair. And because of the thickness of the hair, we couldn't see her face from her back. And we could not distinguish from the back. We said, woe to, be, uh, to you. Who are you? And it said, I am a just a... All this is in the Hadith Muslim. All this is in the Hadith, okay? And we said, what is al Jassas? And it said, you go to this person at the monastery who is wanting, blah, 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 blah. This repetition is hilarious and very poor. And the Messenger of Allah never ever said such a thing. But the, the teller of the story 
is doing what? Entertaining people. And they used to do that a lot before. They would sit in the masjid, tell good stories to people like this, and they would take money from it. And it was normal thing at that time there, after Salat al or al Asr, someone would come and he starts, Allah Rasulullah, and people would sit down and he would narrate hadith after hadith after hadith after hadith after hadith, explaining, doing all that kind of stuff. And then when he finishes, he would pass by, take money and leave. It was common thing. Believe me, it was common thing. But anyhow, the chained person said, tell me about the palm trees of Baisan. So now, uh, he knows from they are from Arabia, so Baisan is a small part uh, in London, you would say, for example, Fulham. Tell me about the palm trees of Baisan, a place. We said, what kind of information do you want? He said, have these palm trees produced or not? We said, yes, they have. Thereupon he said, they are about not to bear fruits. He said, inform me about the lake of at tabariya in Palestine. We said, uh, what do you want to know? He said, is there water in it? Well, he just told them the lake of at tabariya Of course there is water in it, mister. But anyhow, they said, there is abundance of water in it. Thereupon he said, it's about to get dry. Huh. He again said, tell me about the valley of Zuhar or Zugar. They said, what do you want to know? Again, at the jail, tells them, is there water in it? And do they irrigate with water the land and get produce and things like that? We answered, yeah, there is abundance of water in it. And the inhabitants of that valley water the lands with it. He said, tell me about the prophet of the Ummiyin. What has he done? Ummiyin. <laughs> well, I'll leave the lie in this hadith. It's, it's, it's incredible. Well, I'll leave the, 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 the manipulation. is is cool. It is really... But anyhow, Ummiyin in Al-Quran is they tell you, and it's strongly translated as the unlettered, the ignorant people who don't read and write. And people say, oh, the messenger doesn't read and write and he's Ummi. What, uh, this is wrong translations. Ummiyin, as Allah says it in the Quran, is, is just the Gentiles. The Jews call anyone who is not a Jew a Gentile. The translation of Gentile is Ummi. That's all there is to it. So, but anyhow, when Allah said the Nabi al Ummi in Al Quran, He meant He was not a Jew. That's all there is to it. Allah wouldn't tell them that my messenger is ignorant, is a dead ignorant, can't read and can't write, and here he is telling you Quran because. No, it's, but anyhow, that is a topic for another day. And uh, the, he said to them, what is the Ummiyin has done, the, their prophet? We said, he has come out from Mecca and has settled in al Madina in Yathrib. He said, have the Arabs fought against him? We said, yeah. He said, how did he deal with them? We informed him that he had overcome those in his neighborhood and they had submitted themselves before him. Thereupon he said to us, has it really happened? We said, yeah, 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 it has. Yeah, yeah. Then he said, well, if it is so, then it is better for them to obey him. I am now going to tell you about myself. Now, I wanted to wait for it, but like for, for tragic effects, drum rolls and all that kind of stuff. All right? And then he tells them, I am a Dajjal. And I soon will be permitted to come out. And once that happens, I will travel the land and there won't be a town that I won't conquer. All that within 40 nights. Mecca and Medina will be off limits to me. Those two cities are made haram, uh, prohibited areas for me. I will not make any attempt to enter any of the two cities because I will be met by an angel carrying a sword in his hand ready to confront me and ready to bar my way and there would be angels to guard every passage leading to their entrance. Wallahi, what a bunch of mediocrity. Wallahi al how, how, how did this Dajjal know about the future? Did Allah reveal it to him? If then, then he is a messenger. He is a prophet at least. Was it Allah that suddenly has decided to have another prophet by just parallel to Muhammad have the Dajjal? These are lies upon lies upon lies. And the man who was telling this bedtime story was embellishing it with all kinds of nonsense. 
and suddenly it became a hadith and we have to believe in it and if you don't believe in this nonsense you go to hellfire anyway let's carry on then Allah's messenger started to strike the member he had a stick in his hand and started th and then he says this is i.e. al-madina tayyiba this is tayyiba this is tayyiba i.e. it's a good city this is a good city referring to al-madina that the messenger of Allah speaking to his audience is reported to have said have I not told you something like this about the Dajjal the people said oh yeah, yeah you did you did you did of course all this is nonsense I'm just adding some embellishment to it he then added this narrative of Tamim al Dari, who used to be Christian now embraced Islam was like the one I told you about at the jail and about Mecca and Al Madina and I liked it so it's not a matter of uh, revelation from Allah it's a matter of preference it's what version the Prophet liked so Tamim al Dari told him that I liked it yeah it's a good one so he liked it so isn't the hadith supposed to be revelation from Allah if so, why did he feel the need to justify what he told them with the story of Tamim? Did he need Tamim's story to like it? But when someone starts a lie, the next lie is needed to justify the first one. And the third one is to make the second one seem right so that the first one is something you don't dispute, dispute at all. And the lies go on and on and on, on. Then the messenger, they say, added. He certainly, so now that he told them all this story about the Dajjal and the island and things like that, the Prophet, they say, wanted to add his own weight. Kind of like, uh, oh, by the way, uh, they got lost 30 days in the sea, right? Well, I know what the Dajjal is. He, he is certainly in the Syrian Syria Sea. And he pointed to the east. He goes, no, 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 no. Or the Yemen Sea. And he pointed to the, to the south. No, 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 on the contrary. He is in the east, in the east, in the east. And he pointed with his hands towards the east, towards Iran. You see, just out of his own head, guess where? Oh, he is there. No, 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 he's not there. So you pointed the west, he's there. No, 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 it's not there. It's actually south. No, 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 it's east. And uh, I don't know why, but anyhow. Of course, this hadith... Is, is absolutely nonsense. And the hadith mechanics said, as the messenger said that, they said, when the messenger said, oh, it's in the West, Jibreel corrected him. And when he said in the South, they said Jibreel corrected him. And when he said it's in the East, Jibreel kept quiet. And that's when the messenger said, it's kind of like, oh, he is uh, on the West. No, 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 he's in the East. No, 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 he's, yeah, he's in the East. Jibril, no correction. Oh, it's in the East. Yeah, it's, it's totally in the East. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Isn't Jibril supposed to bring the revelation and the Prophet speak it? No, it's the other way around. Is the Prophet out of his own head, plays with the text. If Jibril collects. No, no, it's wrong. I'm sorry. If Jibril says nothing, it is Islam. Of course, all this is absolutely nonsense. This is an accusation of the messenger of Allah of being a man who says what he doesn't even know. Even though Allah has forbidden in the Quran that whenever you want to say something, you need evidence for it. Do not say anything, do not follow anything that which you do not have a knowledge about. Why, ya Allah? In the sama, the hearing, wal basara, the eyesight, wal fuad, the thinking, all these will be asked, will be held responsible on judgment day. The Prophet Muhammad couldn't have said this hadith, it's impossible. And then Fatima, daughter of Qais, added, I memorized it from Allah's Messenger. Of course, my dear sisters, uh, we're coming to an end here because it's taken time. But this man made hadith is very peculiar, very strange, and out of this world, and is a plain lie altogether. Now, listen to it like my sisters and my brothers. A hadith with this danger, a hadith with this importance, a hadith with this Hollywoodic, futuristic, post apocalyptic things, right? Only one woman, one woman, one woman narrates it out of the thousands of people there. I think if you tell people today, uh, right now we have the coronavirus, right? If somebody speaks, it's, it's everybody talks about the coronavirus. If this event really, the messenger told it, the whole Medina would be upside down. No, we have one woman, one, 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 one. I want you to just point one, one. 
who tells the hadith. And it's only her who memorized it from Allah's messenger. It's a full of lies hadith, it's fabrications, false claims, it's filled with evil from head to toe. And whenever a reputable man of religion challenges its authenticity or its meaning, and many, many have, by the way, a hell breaks over the head. For example, the last known man that just challenged this hadith and refused it and rejected it was the Wahhabi Sheikh, Ibn Uthaymeen. Uh, Ibn Uthaymeen refused this hadith and he says there is something in my heart against this hadith and I don't accept it. And uh, just to, uh, to end this talk here, this hadith about the Dajjal and the island and all this nonsense is more of an insult to the Messenger of Allah, is more of an insult to Allah than anything else. A man is trapped in an island that knows a lot of things about a man that lives in some islands and this uh, the general knows so many things about the places, crops, people, and this woman knows more about these people than it's it, it, it's it's incredible, it's incredible. But anyway, my dear sisters and my brother, I'm gonna just stop here. I just need to tell you uh, this and, and my talk. If we are to believe that at the jail the con man is alive these days and that he will be alive until the end of time, then we have a problem. And the problem being that in an authentic hadith by Bukhari and Muslim, they say that the Prophet, uh, the Messenger of Allah, is reported to have said that at the end of each hundred years, there will be a new generation, meaning every hundred years, all humanity will die and by that time is a new generation. Of course, this is not true because there are people who live 125, things like that. But this hadith is also in al-Bukhari. Okay? And then we have a Dajjal that's going to live thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. At least now he's living 1,400 years since the Prophet Muhammad. And we're going to add 600 years till Jesus. And we're going to add because every Prophet that came on earth warned his people from a Dajjal. And then this Ad-Dajjal has been living what? For 50,000 years? It's either we believe in the hadith of the hundred years, there will always be a new generation, i.e. everybody will die, or we believe in the hadith of the Dajjal will continuously live until the end of time. And this is why Ibn Uthaymin and many other scholars have said that this hadith is weak and cannot be uh, taken as a hadith that talks about the future. Of course, Ibn Uthaymin's deduction and statement didn't register well at all with the Salafi sect or the Wahhabis. And all venues were explored to show Ibn Uthaymin was wrong without making him look bad in front of his followers. So they say, you know what, Ibn Uthaymin here is not... So they just wanted to make him wrong, but not wrong. And this is a very strong predicament to find yourself in. And it's a deadlock. It, and this Salafi's mind has gone completely froze. The mighty Ibn Uthaymin is wrong. You kidding? Ibn Uthaymin is wrong? What's wrong with you? This man is never wrong. This man has got uh, six Jibrils on his head, and then he never goes wrong. But he actually said this hadith in Muslim is wrong. No, 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 no. Oh, maybe, 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 maybe. And, and, and it's, it's strange. But here is what they did. They looked in the history of Ibn Uthaymin, of his sheikhs. Who of his sheikhs could have influenced Ibn Uthaymin? So they went direct sheikhs, indirect sheikhs, and things like that. Guess what? Until they found that Ibn Uthaymin's distance influences one sheikh, one sheikh who is very distant from Ibn Uthaymin, a sheikh who taught another sheikh who taught another sheikh who taught Ibn Uthaymin, was a Lebanese sheikh called Muhammad Rashid Rida. And this guy was born in 1865 Christian era, we are 2020, uh, and he was born in 1865 and died in 1935, he died in the 20th century. And this Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida himself was a student of a great mind Sheikh, of an incredible Sheikh called Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, an Egyptian Sheikh, born in 1849 and died in 1905 in Egypt. Now, they say Ibn Uthaymin, who was born in 1929, and he died in 2001, and uh, in Saudi Arabia, what they say is that Ibn Uthaymin 
actually took his understanding from Muhammad Rashid Rida. And Muhammad Rashid Rida is not liked at all in the Salafi world. And for that, they blamed Ibn Uthaymin's argument on Muhammad Rashid Rida, not on Ibn Uthaymin. And this is how it got, they got the messenger of Allah, Ibn Uthaymin, out of the accusation chair. My dear sisters and my brothers, in the Salafi sect, Muhammad Rashid Rida is very unwelcomed personality. Him and his teacher, Muhammad Abdu. If you want to anger any Salafis today, I don't talk about those little kids, okay, who read two words and... No, I'm talking about the sheikhs. If you mention this, Muhammad Rashid Rida and Muhammad Abdu, it's like you told them, my sheikh is Iblis and uh, Shaitan is my teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, this was enough for the Salafis to break Ibn Uthaymin's opinions down. But they also know that Ibn Uthaymin isn't foolish. He is not easily influenced person. And for that, they needed to make sure that anyone that ever listens to Ibn Uthaymin's opinion can never be influenced. And for that, what they did, they warned and hid this from people. You never hear the argument of Ibn Uthaymin in front of people. You don't. Anyone. I just want to end up here, and inshallah, next one we're going to talk about the women who will go to Ad Dajjal, and then we carry on in this long uh, scene of Ad Dajjal. There is a lot to be said, inshallah. And until part two gets recorded pretty much soon, inshallah, I hope you enjoy this. And again, if you have any comments, anything, please do leave messages, uh, Islam Pep Talk, you can send me messages, and if you are in my group on WhatsApp, you can send me messages, I put this information to you as I believe in, as I would love to meet Allah with, okay, and uh, that's it, and then you are free, if you want to carry on believing in a Dajjal and experience and say that this futuristic person is going to come and set us free and blah blah blah, you are free to do that. All you need to do is be prepared on Judgment Day to prove why you believed in a Dajjal. On, on Judgment Day, for information, you cannot have Al-Bukhari said, Muslim said, on Judgment Day, Alam takun ayati tutla'alik. Weren't my ayat that are in the Quran being recited to you? And you will spend your whole eternity reading Al-Quran to Allah and you will not find one single reference to a Dajjal in Al-Quran. This should have been enough. But people are people. The Jews played with the Bible. The Christians played. With, uh, the Jews played with the Torah. The Bible played with the uh, the Bible. The Christians played with the Bible. And we Muslims, we play with the Quran, the Hadith, and we create all this mess. Until the next talk, inshallah, stay in the mercy of Allah. And uh, again, allow me to be the stickler in the mad and openly this uh, man invented Hadith. I don't believe in the content of Muslim as it was told, documented, the mechanics and all of that. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa, and I pray to Allah that you all get well, do well, keep yourself well, tucked away from the coronavirus, listen to all those advices, and till next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If you want to join my group, please do send me a message on 07876. 408735 on WhatsApp. Uh, if you want to discuss anything, argument, if you want to challenge what I said, everything you are most welcome to it. Till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What is you?